Chapter Thirteen of Nutcracker and Mouse King by E. T. A. Hoffman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Capital. Nutcracker clapped his little hands together again. When the Rose Lake began to dash louder, the waves rolled higher, and Maria perceived a car of shells covered with bright, sparkling, gay-coloured jewels moving toward them in the distance, drawn by two golden-scaled dolphins. Twelve the loveliest little moors, with caps and aprons braided of hummingbird's feathers, leaped upon the shore and carried first Maria and then Nutcracker with a soft gliding step over the waves and placed them in the car, which straightway began to move across the lake. Ah, how delightful it was as Maria sailed along, with the rosy air and the rosy waves breathing and dashing around her. The two golden-scale dolphins raised up their heads and spouted clear crystal streams out of their nostrils, high, high in the air, which fell down again in a thousand quivering, flashing rainbows. And it seemed as if two small silver voices sang out, who sails upon the rosy lake, the little fairy, awake, awake, music and song, bim, bim, fishes, sim, sim, swans, tweet, tweet, birds, whiz, whiz, breezes, rustling, ringing, singing, blowing, a fairy o'er the waves is going. Rosy billows murmuring, playing, dashing, cooling the air, roll along, along. But the singing of the falling fountains did not seem to please the twelve little moors, who were seated up behind the car, for they shook their parasol so hard that the palm leaves of which they were made rattled and clattered, and they stamped with their feet in very strange time, and sang, clap and clip and clip and clap, backward and forward, up and down. Moors are a merry folk, said Nutcracker, somewhat disturbed. But they will make the whole lake rebellious. And very soon there arose a confused din of strange voices, which seemed to float in the sea and in the air. But Maria did not heed them for she was gazing in the sweet-scented rosy waves, out of which the face of a charming little maiden smiled up upon her. Ah! she cried joyfully, and struck her hands together. Look, look, dear Master Drosselmeyer, there is the Princess Pearlypat down in the water. Oh, how sweetly she smiles upon me! Nutcracker sighed quite sorrowfully and said, O oh, kindest Miss Stalbarn, that is not the Princess Pearlypat. It is you. You, it is your own lovely face that smiles so sweetly out of the Rose Lake. Upon this, Maria drew her head back very quickly, put her hands before her face and blushed very much. At this moment she was lifted out of the car by the twelve moors and carried to the shore. They now found themselves in a little thicket, which was perhaps more beautiful even than the Christmas wood. It was so bright and sparkling. What was most wonderful in it were the strange fruits that hung upon the trees, which were not only curiously coloured, but gave out also every kind of sweet odour. We are in Sweetmeat Grove, said Nutcracker, but yonder is the capital. And what a sight! How can I venture, children, to describe the beauty and splendour of the city, which now displayed itself to Maria's eyes, upon the broad, flowery meadow before them? Not only did the walls and towers glitter with the gayest colours, but the style of the buildings was like nothing else that is to be found in the world. Instead of roofs, the houses had diadems set upon them, braided and twisted in the daintiest manner, and the towers were crowned with variegated trellis work, 
and hung with festoons, the most beautiful that ever were seen. As they passed through the gate, which looked as if it were built of macaroons and candied fruits, silver soldiers presented arms, and a little man in a brocade dressing gown threw himself upon Nutcracker's neck with the words, Welcome, best prince, welcome to Confectionville. Maria was not a little astonished to hear young Drosselmeyer called a prince by such a distinguished man. But she now heard such a hubbub of little voices, such a huzzahing and laughter, such a singing and playing, that she could think of nothing else, and turned to Nutcracker to ask him what it all meant. O oh, worthiest Miss Stahlbaum, it is nothing uncommon. Confectionville is a populous and merry city, thus it goes here every day. Let us walk farther, if you please. They had only gone a few steps when they came to the great market place, which presented a wonderful sight. All the houses around were of sugared filigree work. Gallery was built over gallery, and in the middle stood a tall obelisk of white and red sugared cream, while four curious sweet fountains played in the air of orgeat, lemonade, mead and soda water, and in the great basin were soft bruised fruits, mixed with sugar and cream and touched a little by the frost. But prettier than all this were the charming little people, who, by thousands, pushed and squeezed, knocked their heads together, huzzahed, laughed, jested and sang, who had raised indeed that merry din which Maria had heard at a distance. Here were beautifully dressed men and women, Armenians and Greeks, Jews and Tyrolese, officers and soldiers, preachers, shepherds and harlequins, in short, all the people that can possibly be found in the world. On one corner the tumult increased, the people rocked and reeled to clear the way, for just at that moment the Grand Mogul was carried by in a palaquin, attended by ninety-three grandees of the kingdom and seven hundred slaves. Now on the opposite corner the fishermen, five hundred strong, were marching in procession, and it happened, very unfortunately, that the Grand Turk, took it into his head just then to ride over the marketplace with three thousand janissaries, besides which a long train came from the festival of sacrifices with sounding music singing, up and thank the mighty sun, and pushed straight on for the obelisk. Then what a squeezing and a pushing and a rattling and a clattering. By and by a screaming was heard, for a fisherman had knocked off a Brahmin's head in the crowd, and the great mogul was almost run over by a harlequin. The tumult grew wilder and wilder, and they had commenced to beat and strike each other, when the man in the brocade dressing gown, who had called Nutcracker a prince at the gate, clambered up by the obelisk, and having thrice pulled a little bell, called out three times, Confesseur, confesseur, confesseur. The tumult was immediately appeased. Each one tried to help himself as well as he could, and, after the confused trains and processions were set in order, and the dirt upon the great mogul's clothes was brushed off, and the Brahmin's head put on again, the former hubbub began anew. What do they mean by confesseur, good master Drosselmeyer? asked Maria. Ah, best Miss Stahlbaum, replied Nutcracker. By confesseur is meant an unknown but very fearful power, which they believe can do with them as he pleases. It is the fate that rules over this merry little people, and they fear it so much that the mere mention of the name is able to still the great tumult. Each one then thinks no longer of anything earthly, of cuffs and kicks and broken heads, but retires within himself and says, What are we and what is our destiny? Maria could not refrain from a loud exclamation of surprise and wonder 
as all at once they stood before a castle glimmering with rosy light and crowned with a hundred airy towers beautiful nosegays of violets narcissuses tulips and dahlias were hung about the walls and their dark glowing colours only heightened the dazzling rose-tinted white ground upon which they were fastened the large cupola of the centre building and the sloping roofs of the towers were spangled with a thousand gold and silver stars we are now in front of marchpane castle said nutcracker maria was completely lost in admiration of this magic palace yet it did not escape her that one of the large towers was without a roof while little men were moving around it upon a scaffolding of cinnamon as if busied in repairing it but before she had time to inquire about it nutcracker continued not long ago this beautiful castle was threatened with serious injury if not with entire destruction the giant sweet tooth came this way and bit off the roof of yonder tower and was gnawing upon the great cupola when the people of confectionville gave up to him a full quarter of the city and a considerable portion of sweetmeat grove as tribute with which he contented himself and went his way at this moment soft music was heard the doors of the palace opened and twelve little pages marched out with lighted clothes which they carried in their hands like torches each of their heads was a pearl their bodies were made of rubies and emeralds and they walked upon feet cast out of pure gold four ladies followed them almost as tall as maria's clara but so richly and splendidly dressed that she saw in a moment that they were princesses born they embraced nutcracker in the tenderest manner and cried with joyful sobs oh my prince my best prince oh my brother nutcracker seemed very much moved he wiped the tears out of his eyes then took maria by the hand and said with great emotion this is miss maria stahlbaum the daughter of a much respected and very worthy physician and she is the preserver of my life had she not thrown her shoe at the right time had she not supplied me with the sword of a pensioned colonel, I should now be lying in my grave, torn and bitten to pieces by the terrible Mouse King. View her, gaze upon her, and tell me if Pearlypat, although a princess by birth, can compare with her in beauty, goodness, and virtue. No, I say, no and all the ladies cried out no and then fell upon maria's neck exclaiming ah dear preserver of the prince our beloved brother charming miss maria stahlbaum she now accompanied these ladies and nutcracker into the castle and entered a room the walls of which were of bright coloured crystal but of all the beautiful things which Maria saw here, what pleased her most were the nice little chairs, sofas, secretaries and bureaus with which the room was furnished, and which were all made of cedar or Brazil wood and ornamented with golden flowers. The princesses made Maria and Nutcracker sit down and said that they would immediately prepare something for them to eat they then brought out a great many little cups and saucers and plates and dishes all of the finest porcelain and spoons knives and forks graters kettles pans and other kitchen furniture all of gold and silver then they brought the finest fruits and sugar things such as maria had never seen before and began in the nicest manner to squeeze the fruits with their little snow-white hands, and to pound the spice and grate the sugar almonds, in short, so to turn and handle everything, 
that Maria could see how well the princesses had been brought up, and what a delicious meal they were preparing. As she desired very much to learn such things, she could not help wishing to herself that she might assist the princesses in their labour. The most beautiful of Nutcracker's sisters, as if she had guessed Maria's secret thoughts, reached her a little golden mortar, saying, O oh, sweet friend, dear preserver of my brother, will you not pound a little of this sugar candy? While Maria pounded in the mortar, Nutcracker began to give a full account of his adventures, of the dreadful battle between his army and that of the Mouse King, and how he had lost it by the cowardice of his troops, how the terrible Mouse King lay in wait to bite him in pieces, and how Maria, to preserve him, gave up many of his subjects who had entered her service, and all just as it had happened. During this narration, it seemed to Maria as if his words became less and less audible, and the pounding of her mortar also sounded more and more distant, until she could scarcely hear it. Presently, she saw a silver gauze before her, in which the princesses, the pages, Nutcracker and herself too, were all enveloped. A singular humming and rustling and singing was heard, which seemed to die away in the distance, and now Maria was raised up, as if upon mounting waves, higher and higher, higher and higher, higher and higher. End of chapter 13